proudly we hail. Hello from Hollywood. This is C.P. McGregor speaking and welcoming you to another broadcast of your War Department program, Proudly We Hail. Through the courtesy of the Hollywood Coordinating Committee, we present the distinguished actor, Mr. Robert Mitchum, as the star of our play, The Ears of the Eagle, with music by Eddie Scrivanek. <laughs> story isn't about a battle or heroics under fire. It's simply about somebody doing a job. In telling about it, our star Robert Mitchum steps into the role of Bill Conway, a radio operator in World War II. Well, I was like a lot of other guys. I hadn't done much before I got into the Army, so I wasn't sure what I could do. But the Army sort of takes care of that. And after a series of tests, I found myself at Scott Field, Illinois, the radio school where the Air Forces tuned the ears of its eagles. I was kind of scared. It was okay with me if the Army wanted to try to turn out a radio operator, only I didn't know if I'd ever be any good at it. But that was because I didn't know Scott Field. Holy cow, I used to think the only letters in the Morse code were SOS. Well, forget that, Bill. Instructor says we'll soon be sending and receiving 16 words a minute. Remember now, if you're not sure you've got your message through, keep sending. Keep sending. Keep sending. Learn the fundamentals. Dig into those radio sets and see what makes them tick. Oh! Wrong wire. I thought they wanted us to learn how to use a radio, not build one. Easy, Bill. Someday you'll be glad you know how to repair one of these babies. It says here. Gentlemen. You've reached graduation day, the end of your studies, but the beginning in your new career as qualified radio men. From here, some of you will be assigned to communications groups or to handle and supervise our radio ranges or maintenance units, and some will go on to become members of a bomber team. In any event, gentlemen, good luck, and the congratulations of your commanding general and the president of the United States. Some of us would go on to become members of a bomber team. Well, I was one of the lucky ones. At least I thought I was lucky, because a few weeks later, the roar of a giant B-29's motor sounded mighty sweet. I'll never forget our team's first flight together. That old feeling kind of came back on me when I took over in the radio operator's compartment and called the tower to clear it for landing. Power from 9179. How are you receiving me? 9179 from tower. I'm receiving you RSS5. And relax, Conway. Relax. Roger. Yeah, that's the way it was that first hop. Oh, I guess all of us were nervous. Everybody from pilot to tail gunner. But that was just at first. After a while, we got the feel of things and got to know everybody on the team. And what a team they were. <laughs> Then one morning, we started off on what we thought was just another routine training flight. We were heading out over the coast to get in some more overwater navigation, or so we thought. Suddenly, the intercom cracked on, and the pilot's voice came over, talking to all of us. Pilot to crew, pilot to crew. Listen, everybody, this might interest you. Sorry I couldn't tell you last night so you could have kissed the gals goodbye, but this morning we took off under sealed orders. We're on our way across. Hey, <laughs> oh, brother, we're on our way across. Only none of us knew that something was going to happen before we ever got there. Our play, Ears of the Eagle, will continue immediately following a message from the Honorable Mon C. Waldron, governor of the state of Washington, who recently said... The maximum number of voluntary enlistments in the new regular army is necessary in order to release men who have had long and arduous war service and also to build up the regular army to a strength adequate to meet our needs for occupational duty overseas and to protect our national interests. 
The success of the voluntary enlistment program will be an indication to the other nations of the world of our attitude toward our post-war commitments for international order and peace. The regular army offers men of 17 to 34 years of age inclusive, security in the form of pay and allowances, liberal retirement benefits, allowances for dependents, generous opportunities for education, both while in service and after release under the GI Bill of Rights. And the still more broadening phase of education gained by travel, experience, and the acquisition of new skills. I earnestly urge the people of our nation to make every effort to assist in this urgent campaign to build up the new regular army. And now Robert Mitchum in the role of radio operator Bill Conway continues his story. Yes, after weeks, after months of training, we had our wish. We were on our way over. That excited feeling kept up for quite a few miles. But after six hours out, fickle old lady luck turned against us when our two right engines quit. That caused us a ditch. In less than a minute after Skip Hapgood, our pilot landed us on the water, we were into the life rafts. The great fin of our bomber was slipping under the waves. We were alone in the middle of the Pacific. We had a pretty good idea of how invisible we were on the surface of that ocean. Nine pairs of eyes turned on me. How's, how's the portable transmitter, Bill? Oh, it's not so good, Skipper. The antenna's out. I guess it's because of the impact when we hit. And part of the... Oh, well, don't worry. I'll get something out of it. I sure hope so, Bill. We all sure hope so. But they all knew that finding us without radio contact made looking for a needle in a haystack easy. I just couldn't let them down. Somehow, some way, I had to get that transmitter working again. Hey, Skipper. Skipper, I think I got her. Huh? Well, go on, Bill. Try her. Okay. Well... Is it all right? Well, she's got to warm up first. Oh. No, no, it's no good. For Pete's sake, Bill, what are you doing with that transmitter? Just playing? Oh, cut it out, Hank. Just keep track of our course. All right, Bill, fiddle around with her again for a while. We're still counting on you, you know. Any, any water left, Skipper? Oh, sure. Here. Take it easy. You don't want to flood your carburetor, do you? Skipper, how's the chocolate holding out? Sorry, Hank. You've had yours for the day. Oh, Alice, why didn't you phone me before we left? You know, I'm not going to fall for that busy signal again. Now, easy, easy, Joe. Uh, that's the boy. You'll be all right. We all will. I hope. It was driving me crazy, too. No, not the sun and not the lack of food and water and not even the fear. Just the idea that they were all counting on me. I was the only one who could do it. I had to do it. I racked my brain for everything I had learned at Scott Field. Learn the fundamentals. Dig into those sets and see what makes them tick. Someday you'll be glad to know how to repair one of these babies. Suddenly I had an idea. Hey, Skipper, Skipper, toss me your shoe, will you? Oh, you got something figured, Bill? I don't know yet, but it's worth a try. Well, here you are. I can use this rubber heel for insulation. Well, how about this bridge work of mine, Bill, if you can use nah, it? Ah, you better hang on to that, Steve. You can't tell when Ed might catch something with that fishing outfit, and you'll need your teeth. Only, hey, Hank, lend me your specs, will you? I need some of the metal from that frame. Hey, fellas. Fellas, I've got it. It works. Oh, wonderful, huh? Bill. Wonderful. You hear that? You hear it? Well, what are we waiting for? Hank, give him our position. Okay. Go on, Bill. Send it out. Send it out. No, it's still no use. Yeah, what do you Why mean? not? What's the matter? Oh, the set's working, but I've got no antenna. Oh. The signals won't carry a mile. How are we going to send anything? Hey, wait a minute. Ed, give me that fishing pole. Skipper, let me have your shirt. 
My, my shirt. Give it to me. We're going to fly a kite to lift our radio antenna into the sky. <laughs> It's hopeless looking for those guys. Not a sign of anything out here. Yeah, we better head back. Gas is running low. No, wait. I'm getting something. I'm getting a signal. Listen. Hey, it's them, all right. That's Bill Conway on the key sending their position. Oh, there'll be no trouble picking them up now. So Bill Conway got his set working and he got a message through. He lived up to everything the crew expected of him. And the ingenuity he displayed in rebuilding the damaged transmitter and in flying a kite made of a torn shirt and an emergency fishing pole led to a citation and a promotion when Bill and the rest of his bomber team were safe on shore again. But I wanted to tell his story because it had to do with a lot more than just heroics. It had to do with a guy who understood his job because he'd learned it right. Bill Conway is still in the Army, by the way, he found a career, a future in world communications, radio, television, the magic of radar, an exciting job to be done, to be enjoyed. This is Robert Mitchum saying, thanks for listening to Bill and to me. To impress upon us the military needs of our nation, Proudly we hail is pleased to present the distinguished officer who commanded the United States Army forces during the final stages in the heroic defense of Bataan and who is presently serving in the office of the Secretary of War in Washington, Major General Edward P. King, Jr., General King. One of our serious problems is the security of our country. At the moment, this is not in clear focus because after every war, there comes a natural revulsion to armed might. Our military problems come into view as irritating distractions to our hope of universal peace. Nevertheless, our security today is of vital importance and the national interest demands that everybody understands its nature. The American people must not permit wishful thinking to lead them into the erroneous conclusion that our international commitments can be profitable or successful without the strong backing of an effective military establishment. The people expect their army to do the job, but doing the job depends upon fundamentally upon the citizens' interest in the army. We cannot succeed without public support. The job before us is to disarm and readjust our recent antagonists, to spread hope among millions of confused and hungry peoples, to stand as a rampart for freedom as we understand the word, and to bring order out of the wreckage and chaos of war. To do this great work, a military force of 1,550,000 men is required. This force must not only be obtained, it must be maintained. This can be done if the citizens adopt a resolute attitude and a frankly displayed determination to live up to the dignity of our country's position. The men for this army cannot be conjured into being. They must be recruited from American manpower. From that source must come intelligent young men capable of absorbing the technical knowledge necessary in this age and applying that knowledge to the job at hand. America's new regular army offers a brilliant future to young men. The rewards are generous, the life varied, interesting, and profitable. I urge every young man to investigate fully the facts about the opportunities offered by the army before making a final decision about the future. Thank you, General King, and our thanks also to Mr. Robert Mitchum and Governor Walgren for appearing on this program. Proudly We Hail will come to you again over this station next week. Listen in.